life is not easy. Every day you have to deal with one problem or the other. Generally, life was so hard, mainly for us as traders. But nobody could trust you because you could not be identified. I do business. I buy millet from Uganda. I take it to Kenya. From Kenya, I buy sugar. Before, I need to keep all money in my bag, which is risky. But this time, I'm not worried because I have all the money on my food. I can pay using my savings or I can pay using my deposit. It simplified the time and the costs of trade for me. Before, everybody was supposed to use a passport, which was costly, and the process of getting it was long. National ID, it tells people that this is Agnes. It proves whom I am. When I have an official national ID, I feel secure and safe as a woman, as a trader. Business has helped me as a single parent and I've managed to maintain my family. I can help my siblings, my friends, yeah. Women form the bedrock of our homes and by extension our society. So if we help them grow their businesses, we'll be able to have a very good economy overall. Hello and welcome, no matter where you're logging in from today, it's great to have you joining us for this important conversation about digital financial inclusion for women in Africa. I feel that the voices we just heard in that video really highlight why everything we'll discuss in the next hour or so matters so much. As a journalist from Uganda who's traversed the continent for my reporting, it feels clear to me that whether it's women traders in Uganda or farmers in Gabon, there is no shortage of diligence or entrepreneurial spirit across the continent, but there's often a radical imbalance when it comes to the opportunities available to make the most of those qualities. Investing in women's economic empowerment sets a direct path towards things I believe we all want to see, gender equality, inclusive economic growth, and poverty eradication. 
Of course, we've now got the COVID pandemic as a backdrop to all of this, and it's highlighted just how important digital financial inclusion is if we're going to build back as better, fairer societies. The goal of building a fairer society is one that must involve collaboration at all levels. And that's why today we'll be hearing from global champions, country leaders and local institutions who are all deeply interested in partnering to promote inclusive recovery in Africa. This very conversation is happening Thanks to a partnership, in fact, the G7 Partnership for Women's Digital Financial Inclusion in Africa was launched in 2019 to support African governments and financial institutions to build more inclusive digital financial systems. Now, this partnership is drawing from various strengths, strengths of the Africa Digital Financial Inclusion Facility, the World Bank, the United Nations Capital Development Fund, the Abdul Latif Jamil Poverty Action Lab, and the Oxford Blavatnik School of Government. Implementation resources are provided by the Government of France and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, so our thanks to all of them. Now, as we begin, we'll start off by hearing from a very special guest. Since 2009, Her Majesty Queen Maxima of the Netherlands has served as the United Nations Secretary General's Special Advocate for Inclusive Finance for Development. There is a short way to say that, the UNSGSA. As Special Advocate, Queen Maxima is a leading global voice on advancing universal access to and responsible usage of affordable, effective, and safe financial services. She raises awareness, serves as a convener, encourages leaders, and supports actions to expand financial inclusion at a global and a country level, all in close collaboration with partners from the public and private sector. An important focus of her work is on enabling responsible technology for financial inclusion in support of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. It's an honor to have her here. Queen Maxima, welcome. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to be here. I would like to recognize African policymakers listening today, as well as the leadership of Minister Le Maire and Mrs. Melinda French Gates. Thank you also to Mrs. Gibo and Mr. Kibombo for sharing their perspectives. It is a challenging moment for the world. Job and incomes continue to be lost due to, to, due to the pandemic. Governments, many of which have ex expended unprecedented fiscal resources, are grappling with uneven results from recovery efforts. Although per capita income in 90% of advanced economies is expected to bounce back to pre-pandemic levels next year, only one third of low and middle income countries are expected to do the same. These inequalities underscore the importance of supporting an inclusive economic recovery. This is particularly relevant in Africa, where 63% of women live and work outside the formal financial system. And where small businesses, which were among groups disproportionately affected by the pandemic, account for the overwhelming majority of employment. What does an inclusive recovery mean for Africa? It means understanding women's specific experiences in the face of COVID-19, and placing them at the center of efforts to boost resil resilience. But why? Why women? Because women have been the hardest hit by the pandemic. They have exited the labor force in far greater numbers than men. They're often primary caregivers at home. They rely more on informal work and subsistence farming, making them increased exposure to production and climate related shocks. And they also are confronted with more complex social norms. Today, I offer three reflections on what we have learned the past year about the role of digital financial services to support an inclusive recovery for women across Africa. First, first investing in digital public goods that support financial inclusion for women is no longer a luxury, it is a necessity. These goods, as many as you know, include digital IDs and connectivity. They also include regulation, supporting digital payments, well-functioning and interoperable payment systems, and rules on protecting consumers and managing data. 
It is important that these investments are made with the specific needs of women in mind from the start. For example, developing payment services that work with a variety of mobile phones is important given the gender gap in smartphone ownership. Countries across Africa, including Togo, Namibia, Burkina Faso, and Benin, to name a few, have accelerated these investments and delivered quick economic relief to citizens via digital payments. Some aptly prioritize women. In doing so, these programs provide underserved groups an on-ramp to financial inclusion. And they create opportunities to access and use other products, including savings and insurance. These investments should be applauded. So now is the time to help bring forward countries that still lag behind. We have the technical solutions. Governments can step up commitments to accelerate these investments for the benefit of women and of economic recovery overall. The second point is we must invest in digital solutions that support resilience and livelihoods of African women. In practice, this means looking beyond access to basic accounts and towards savings and insurance products. Let us make sure that people have the proper tools to build long-term buffers. Using technology and innovation to better meet the financial needs of women is extraordinarily important. For example, in Tanzania, women with access to solar lamps through a pay-as-you-go financing reported being more likely to work outside of home. Tasks that were previously needed daylight could now be completed at night, leaving more time for productive labor activities during the day. Women also reported more flexibility to manage childcare and household chores. Yet, while today's global pay go market reaches 100 million people, only 25% of the customers are women. So more tailored solutions are clearly needed. Promoting resilience and livelihoods also means supporting the recovery of women in businesses from COVID-19 through targeted credit lines and well-designed business training programs. And of course, encouraging microfinance institutions and cooperatives, which remain a key provider of financial services to women in Africa, to digitize in order to offer services much more efficiently. The third point is that we can acknowledge that digital technology is not itself a panacea. Women need the appropriate skills and opportunities to use it meaningfully. Bolstering digital and financial capability will help ensure digital technology does not create further divide between men and women. Closely related, we can also double down on efforts to protect users from fraud, ensure data protection, and address algorithm biases in digital platforms. Looking ahead, we have an historic opportunity to recover from COVID-19 in an inclusive manner. One that gives African women and girls the financial tools they need to live more productive and save, safer lives. To do this, we will need to accelerate foundation reforms that support digital financial inclusion for women and invest in interventions that foster long-term resilience, financial health, and improved development outcomes. The G7 partnership offers an excellent platform to accomplish this. I encourage pillar partners to intensify work and coordination amongst themselves. It is also important to build out a comprehensive result framework to ensure accountability under the partnership. I also would like to recognize global lo local leaders active across Africa committed to supporting women's digital financial inclusion. The G7 partnership pillars stand ready to support and provide the technical tools to make meaningful change on the ground. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Queen Maxima, for highlighting some really key points there. It's particularly striking the unevenness of the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic response that you mentioned and brings to the fore why foundational reforms that support uh, digital financial inclusion are so necessary. Thank you very much. Well, next, it's my pleasure to introduce Minister Le Maire, Minister of the Economy, Finance and the Recovery of France. Minister Le Maire is one of the principal architects of the G7 Partnership for Women's Digital Financial Inclusion 
as it was launched during the French G7 presidency back in 2019. Now, like Queen Maxima, Minister Le Maire is involved in helping the G7 partnership implement through his advocacy work with African leaders and by raising awareness of key policy and investments to advance digital financial inclusion in Africa. We asked Minister Le Maire to make a couple of reflections, first on the genesis of the G7P, given his government's ambitions of translating objectives into action. Also, we asked him to describe from his perspective as a G7 finance minister, why the investments in DFI for women are critical to post-pandemic recovery. And I think we can all use a bit of good news after the year we've had. So we also asked him if he could think of an example of a promising project in the area of digital financial inclusion that's being implemented this year. So let's welcome Minister Le Maire. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very pleased to join your event today two years after the release of the report on the G7 Partnership for Women's Digital Financial Inclusion in Africa. I really want to warmly thank Melinda Gates and the Gates Foundation for producing such fantastic work. Melinda, thank you for that. The report had suggested the implementation of leading policies to better include women in the development of digital financial uses. The key issue was to give momentum to the report's policy propositions. Action needs to be taken. And during France's presidency of the G7, the Partnership for Women's Digital Financial Inclusion in Africa, the G7P, was created. And this makes me very proud as France's Minister of Economy and Finance. The partnership offers immense opportunities to unlock digital financial inclusion for women. It brings together donors and stakeholders to support African authorities in providing greater access to their digital financial systems, especially to women. In order to make this partnership sustainable and effective on the long term, I do welcome the collective decision to publish a G7P annual accountability report. It will improve our cooperation. Initiatives such as the G7P are especially important in times of crisis. The COVID-19 crisis has exacerbated social and gender inequalities, especially in the access to digital tools. The crisis has had massive impact on women all around the world. Women make up for 70% of health workers. They were greatly exposed to the virus. Domestic tasks precarious positions and jobs in the informal sector, all supported by women, were the most affected by the crisis. But the COVID-19 crisis has also revealed how much digitalization contributes to the resilience of our economies. The crisis has also accelerated the shift toward digitalization in financial services, communication and policy responses. In order to reduce gender inequalities, it is therefore essential that we collectively invest time and money to unlock digital inclusion for vulnerable populations, especially for women. This is why I strongly encourage African governments and international donors to massively invest in digital financial inclusion as part of their post-COVID-19 recovery plans. Implemented by several institutions, the French contribution to the G7P, $25 million, is primarily dedicated to such investment programs. This contribution, and more broadly, all contributions to all programs supporting entrepreneurship in Africa, are designed to have a decisive impact on women's wealth and inclusion. As an example, we co-finance the AFAWA initiative to reduce the financial gap affecting women in Africa. Now, to answer the moderator's question, among many other projects, I would like to highlight our contribution to the West African Monetary Agency project launched this year by the Africa Digital Financial Inclusion Facility. This leading project aims at implementing a unique gender-based digital financial inclusion framework in the 15 member states of ECOWAS. The project 
will give women the ability to take part to local digital financial markets. It could benefit millions of people across the region. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to take part to this discussion. I wish you all a very good event. And once again, thank you, Melinda, for your involvement in this key issue. Thank you to Minister Le Maire for those remarks and how exciting it is uh, to hear about that project with the West African Monetary Agency with 50 nations in the ECOWAS regions. It means there's potential to affect 350 million people. So that really could have an enormous impact. And speaking of impact, I'm delighted to introduce the speakers for our next segment now, because these are women who truly are doing impactful work, engaging with different facets of digital financial inclusion. With this next discussion, we have an opportunity to dig a little deeper and get a clearer understanding of what's at stake when it comes to how inclusive digital financial systems in Africa are. In different times, we might all be in the same room for this. And while we miss the energy of physically being in the same space, there are some silver linings. Doing things virtually means we can celebrate the opportunity to bring in voices from the field or on the ground and get you even closer to the stories behind why all of this matters. So today you will meet Mariam Jibo, the CEO of Advanced Côte d'Ivoire, one of the leading microfinance institutions in Côte d'Ivoire. Mariam is an innovator in the sector, currently integrating digital tools to effectively support rural populations. Advanced Côte d'Ivoire is a member of the group Advance, which operates on three continents with nine subsidiaries, and its mission is to support the growth of micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises by providing them accessible and affordable financial products and services. Advanced Côte d'Ivoire serves a lot of customers, over 170,000, and employs over 650 people to actively support financial inclusion of disadvantaged populations. You'll also get to meet Grace Majara Chibombo. She's nearly a two decade veteran in the financial inclusion space. And she's currently the deputy director of the Village Savings and Loan Association team at Care Uganda. Now Care works to help the poorest people in the world, especially women and girls get out of poverty, serving over 60 million people in a hundred countries. Understanding the complexities of a supportive ecosystem, Grace's work brings together financial service providers, multinational organizations, and the private sector to co-create innovative solutions and address the needs of unbanked women and youth. Melinda French Gates is a philanthropist, businesswoman, and global advocate for women and girls. For over two decades, she served as the co-chair of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Her poverty alleviation work and interactions in the field have led her to increasingly focus on gender equity as a path to meaningful change. So please welcome to our virtual stage, the view from the field through the lens of Mariam Jibel and Grace Majara and moderated by Melinda French Gates. So Miriam and Grace, so great to be with you both today. I'm so impressed by what you're doing on the African continent to help women with digital financial inclusion, and I'm looking forward to this conversation. Very glad to be here. Thank you, Melinda. Me too. Glad to be here and looking forward to our conversation. Great. So Grace, maybe I'll start with you. This African partnership on financial inclusion, you know, we've heard some of the high level speakers talk about digital financial inclusion and infrastructure, creating an infrastructure, a payment system with digital payments. Can you talk a little bit about the communities that you've been working with and how that digital infrastructure really helps further your work? I would say that uh digital infrastructure is very beneficial to the people we work with, especially the rural-based women, uh, youth, especially adolescent girls. However, I would quickly add that uh, digital infrastructure without matching it with data, it is not really very much beneficial to the intended beneficiary. So I would give you an example of a well-intended uh, policy in Uganda that uh, the financial 
the National Financial Literacy Strategy that he was formulated in 2019. It's really well intended and it's focused is on women, specific, specifically women, youth, the rural-based communities and other vulnerable groups. However, it was not provided with the measurement framework, meaning that it's very hard to measure how it's delivered up to the last mile customer. Mm. I would say to governments that it's very important to invest in research to, to, uh, and collect uh, that, uh, sex, uh, sex disaggregated data so that uh, it's able to be used or no, to monitor and track uh, uh, product uptake and usage and inform gender inclusive policies. Um, I would give another example, like if you were talking to this rural-based woman in Uganda, smallholder farmer, and you try, you are trying to kind of pass on uh, information on some of the digital solutions and platforms. How best can you reach that woman? Is it through radio? Very difficult. Is it through uh, TV? It's very difficult. In most cases, those women get their information from their savings groups and other groups. Uh, other groups. Sometimes they get that information from their friends and families. So it's really very difficult to kind of reach this woman if you don't provide policies that are agenda sensitive, but also tailored to their needs. That's a really good example because I think so often when we program, we we often in our work and development will program thinking, okay, if I program in this way, it's going to reach everybody. But as you just said, women receive information in different places sometimes than men. Miriam, can you talk a little bit about how does this play out in your work in Cote d'Ivoire? Thank you, Melinda. I think um, infrastructure um, is is key. Uh, but first, if we take uh, some step, step back towards the basics, and I will give you just an example of uh, this woman. It's uh, the wife of a Kofkoa farmer that we met um, during a financial uh, literacy class that we were giving in the western part of Cote d'Ivoire. Her name is Ajoa, and she's in her mid-30s. And she came to us because uh, in addition to supporting her husband, to taking care of the household, she has developed a side business, a side cassava, uh, cassava business. And she was attracted uh, by our offer because she wanted to save some money um, with the perspective of getting also some support to buy a tricycle to um, ease to facilitate her supplies in the forest. And so the first question we asked Ajua was, do you have a national identity card? And her answer was, no, I don't. And what we understand is that Ajua was born in the eastern part of Cote d'Ivoire. Her parents did not declare her birth. She did not go to school. She was helping her mother at home. Then when she got married, she uh, went west and settled down with her family. And she tried um, three years ago to get uh, an ID because she wanted to benefit from this uh, national social security system that the government of Cote d'Ivoire was setting up. But unfortunately, because she could not access her birth certificate, she never got the ID. Uh, her birth village was far from her current home. Her parents passed away. So this is so. What we understand is that Ajwa has been living in this like a parallel world uh, where she cannot, uh, I mean, uh, access to all the facilities of, from the formal world, education, coverage system, and now uh, financial services. So if you don't have a birth certificate, you cannot have an ID, you cannot have a bank account. So the hurdles to participate in the economy start at birth. And what is critical is that UNICEF states that in Cote d'Ivoire, three births out of four, out of 10, sorry, are go undeclared. So it means that uh, it handicaps our possibility to access uh, those uh, those rural, rural communities. And when we talk about physical IT, let's talk also about digital. We did develop um, digital onboarding processes to give access to those people in remote areas. But in order to have a bank account, you need to verify the ID. And even a mobile money account, you need to verify the ID. And Unfortunately, the KYCs that are required by the regulators mm. are paper-based. So this means that we had to design a mix of digital and paper, which is very, very costly. So the regulators, the government, have to think about, of course, 
uh, a, a secure and safe way to onboard clients, but also fully digital. This is key. And last, talking now about, I would say, infrastructure. I think that what we really miss on the ground today is one word, interoperability. Mm. And honestly, it's like the shortest road to success. We have this customer telling, telling us, look, I send 20 USD uh, to my mother every month. My mother has a phone from telco operator A. I have a phone from telco operator B because uh, depending on the network, the quality, depending on the region, the network quality is not the same. So it means that in order to send money to my mother, I have to go through two systems with additional costs. And honestly, that she tells us, look, it's better to have the cash in hands. It's less expensive for us. So here, governments have to sit down with MFI, with service provider, in order to build a unique clearing system that will allow us to provide low-cost digital transaction to the poor. This is critical. Wow. You're, you're talking about so many of the steps that are needed to build a real digital financial platform. You know, Grace, you've been doing this work now, I think you said since 2009, so quite a long time. What have you seen in terms of women accessing the system? Miriam talked just briefly about, you know, when it doesn't work for a woman trying to transfer money across uh, without interoperability to another family member. What have you seen that hinders women from actually taking advantage of these accounts, not just signing up and opening an account, but actually using it? And what what do you do to overcome some of those barriers over time? Thank you very much. That's a very good question. I will start with something that, which I usually use in my work. I usually say that we are, whether it's civil society, whether it's private sector, whether it's public, we are usually quick at providing prescription rather than diagnosing the problem. So you find that most of the solutions and the products that are designed are more of prescriptive nature rather than addressing the problem. And the problem will also add that of recent, because of the, I'm calling it COVID era. Because of COVID era, there is a digital COVID era where everybody has woken up and realized that digital is very important and it has provided solutions in a very difficult uh, you know, situation. So even this, uh, this era hasn't left women behind, you know, especially in Uganda, especially in Africa, East Africa mainly, we've really depended on mobile money transfers. You, you transfer money you, to buy products, you transfer money to get treatment and all that. And women have been part of that ecosystem. However, that ecosystem of COVID era has also been more prescriptive nature rather than uh, diagnosis. So I will give an example where, uh, you know, I've worked with so many women in savings groups and I met this one woman in one of the projects that I was implementing in Uganda. So this project was providing uh, women with a chance to open bank accounts. And uh, when we interacted with this woman, like any other member in that group, they had phones, but these were future phones. But the product was designed in a way to depend on that future phone. So it was possible for this woman to open bank, a bank account and be able to transact using her phone. And we said, in our hearts, in our mind, we have a solution for this woman or women like her. So the, the, many of them uh, you know, signed up for the account, but none of them completed the process of mm. account opening. So we said, oh, what is happening? So we went back to interact with this, these women and particularly this woman I interacted with and her story was really capturing. So she told, she told us, I have a phone, but I can't open an account. We said, why? She didn't at the time know the answer because even the bank itself had not explained very well to her in a simplified you know, explanation to her to understand why she couldn't open an account. So further investigation, we realized that uh, she had a phone, but the SIM card in that phone was registered in her, her husband's name. Mm -hmm. And yet it's a requirement for her to open a mobile bank account. So, and uh, when we tried 
support her to change the, 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 the SIM card into her names, it was not possible. The husband would not really mm -hmm. allow her to do so. You know, that was the roadblock number one. And then that's when I realized, reflecting back, that uh, in, in recent development, we are talking about technology as a, 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 you know, a solution, but it's not in itself a solution, especially to women financial inclusion. We are forgetting the social norms that come up, come up with the, you know, the setup of our society, the setup of the way how we live, our families, and things like that. This woman went ahead to tell us that even using this phone was causing problems with her husband because the husband wanted to know and he would check whom she had talked to, which, which call has come in, which call has gone out. And in the process, she was, he was also checking the SMSs would, that were coming in, meaning that she would find it very hard to even deposit money on her mobile money wallet, meaning that even her privacy was taken away from her. Then to make matters worse, she told, uh, she told me that, look here, even when I save, you know, uh, savings groups allow these women to come together, they save, then at the end of nine months or 12 months, they share out so that they have a lump sum that they can use either to invest or even accumulate asset. But because she's a woman at the end of that cycle, she hands over all that money saved to her husband to decide on how best to use it. And of course, I mean, evidence has proven that the men have never been good at planning for the household needs, like food, like you know, education and all that. So all those are some of the things that we never think about. Uh, this woman was restricted in terms of leaving home. Even when she would go to get health services, she would first ask for permission. And sometimes that permission was not given to her. So when we are kind of you know, coming up with solutions, we never think about some of those untold financial inclusion barriers, which is the big elephant in the house, the social norms. And, uh, you know, and nobody's willing to even look at there when we are designing policies, when we are designing products, when we are implementing we usually forget about the impact of the social norms and how women have failed to benefit fully to get their financial autonomy from, you know, from their efforts because of social norms. Wow, that is incredibly helpful, Grace, because I think so often we don't think about what are these other pieces going on in the home or the community that's holding a woman back. What is your experience, Miriam, in Cote d'Ivoire? What's keeping women from saying, this is for me, I want an account, or I want to use this account now that I have it? I think something we have to acknowledge is that we are, we are still living in a cash culture. And so we do have, and it will be the, the case, I think, for the next 20 years, it will be progressive. You know? So we have to design a system that takes into account this cash culture and I would say it's associated value, which is trust. It's, it's critical. So at, at Mans Cote d'Ivoire, we realized that, that we needed to do, um, to do more in terms of building trust and uh, acknowledging this, um, this cash culture. Customers, they need to uh, make sure that their cash is safe. They need to make sure uh, that, that the cash is there. Um, they don't know you. So what we decided to do is um, uh, are three things. The first one is that we build a team of 30 financial inclusion trainers. Um, they each cover an area of about, I don't know, 75 square kilometers. And they go from village to village. Uh, they give classes where they speak about what is a bank account, where does your money go when you put in a bank account? What is behind your phone when you have a digital tool? What is a saving, et cetera, et cetera. And it can take up to sometimes four visits to a same village to open only one bank account. But it's absolutely necessary because the institution needs to be embodied. The relationship to the institution needs to be embodied. The second thing we have done is that we have decided to partner uh, with economic uh, association cooperatives 
or the VSLAs that are built by Care, by Grace, sorry, and um, and her colleague uh, at Cares. Uh, not only those partners uh, do they connect us uh, to the rural communities, but we are able to base our relationship upon the existing relationship uh, from Care or from the cooperative. So we build upon uh, the existing trust the existing uh, relationship, the existing legitimacy of this uh, of this association, because they don't know us. So referral um, helps uh, building this trust. And lastly, because we understood that um, the customer need to be reassured that his cash uh, is available at any time. Um, you know, we have people that are used to put money under the mattress and count it every night. Um, so when we realized that, we decided to partner with uh, local community leaders and ask them to open uh, an agent network, so a fully, a completely rural agent network in the village so that the customer can transact, so cash in and cash out, closer to home, but also with somebody they know. And this is where um, uh, coming to access and usage, the fact of uh, building distrust, the, fam the fact of giving access at any time uh, to the customer to his, uh, to his account is, uh, is essential. And we need help from the government in order to design a regulation around agent network, which is, of course, uh, safe for the customer to transact at a given point, but also flexible enough to fit the needs of the poor and the rural communities. I really like how you've both given us extremely concrete examples about how the pieces need to be built one on top of the other to pull women in. And I think it's so important because not only then can they transact digitally, but then we also know governments are putting a lot of digital social protection payments in through these systems because they realize if it actually reaches the woman, not the man in the household, she'll spend it on the family. So it's really great to hear how you all are connecting these ideas to both what the high level is, is being discussed on the policies and platforms, but how it really then plays out on the ground for women and families. So I really appreciate that. I know you are a famous advo advocate for women, economic empowerment and equality. I've been a fan of you. And in my stream of work, I work with so many strong women, uh, probably who have a lot in common with you and they are caring for their families and are leaders solving problems in their own capacity and world. How can we bring in and uh, elevate these women's voice who do not have a global platform, uh, but can articulate these, their challenges that affect them and help contribute towards desi designing their own, their own solutions, but also informing policy? Thanks for that question, Grace. I think what you brought up is incredibly important. You know, we can create this policy at the high level but if it's not informed with women's real life situations and the barriers that hold them back or the issues that they face day to day, we'll never create the right policy and programming. So it's the work that the two of you do with people on the ground where you can see women's lives and what affects them and hear, okay, this is how we need to change policy or programming. We absolutely have to collect data on women's lives and data and their stories, and we have to then take their voices and connect it to the high-level leaders who are making these changes in country. If we don't do that, we're not going to be effective in what we do and how we help change whole societies for women. So I absolutely agree. We've got to have platforms to make sure that we connect these voices to the people who are making policy recommendations. And one of the things that we've done this past year through the UN is this Generation Equality Forum, and it's been a great place to bring those voices together, but we need to have so many other places that we do it. I, um, I am so encouraged from our conversation today, you know, hearing what you're both advancing, Grace, what you've been advancing over a number of years. Miriam, you've come into this field in the last two years. But the way you're taking apart the problems, listening to women, helping them lead lives and improve their own lives, that's what leads to empowerment. So I couldn't be more thrilled with our conversation today and really 
the way in which you're doing your programming, but helping us think through these digital platforms and ID systems, I really do think they're going to uh, improve women's lives, not just in one family, but hundreds of millions of families. So thanks for our conversation today. Thank you. Too. Thank you, Thank you very too. much. Thank you. What a fantastic conversation to be able to listen into Mariam Jivo and Grace Majara in conversation with Melinda French Gates there. So many things to take away from that. I love that there were many concrete examples of things that governments and financial agencies can do. Mariam talked about interoperability as one thing that would drastically uh, improve women's participation in the digital economy. She also talked about technology in itself not being a solution because the social context must be considered. And I love that because what privacy means for many people might be a password, but in the context that she was talking about, it goes beyond that. It's about what the social norms are and what women, what barriers women face and how technology can help to get around some of those barriers. Grace also really highlighted the importance of research and data, how important it is to know what's working and come up with policies that are gender inclusive. She said, sometimes there is a tendency to be prescriptive rather than to diagnose the problems, highlighting that sometimes the problem is we don't understand the problem. And this is really about helping women design their own solutions. We also heard about how the pandemic has disproportionately affected women. We sadly heard that many women remain invisible to their national government. And because of that, they didn't receive the same levels of income support as men through the pandemic. Government leaders recognize the importance of digitalization to post-pandemic economic recovery, but as we've heard, they need to put more emphasis and resources to make sure that women are included. Fantastic conversation. And one of the threads that has been running through the different insights we've heard today is that when we work together to remove those barriers that are preventing many African women from taking part in the digital economy, they are then able to improve their economic opportunities and provide income security for their families. And of course, the wonderful thing about leveraging partnerships to advance this financial include, inclusion agenda is that there is strength in numbers. The beautiful thing about collaboration is it divides the task and multiplies the success. So as we end this conversation, I hope you might spare a moment or two to think about how you too can contribute or continue contributing, if you already are, to the goal of digital financial inclusion for women in Africa. Because for women like Adjua, who Maria mentioned earlier, who's running her cassava selling business in Cote d'Ivoire, these initiatives can be life-changing, not just for her, but for her family and for her community as well. Thank you ever so much for your time and attention today and goodbye. Thank you.